Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, I want to welcome you to the uh, uh, monthly Hanford Transfer Institute lecture series. And uh, today we have a very exciting presentation for you. Um, one of the unique things in transplantation is that uh, we've been in the arena of public reporting of transplant outcomes uh, as uh, early as 1987, if I recall. And this was done through what we call the Scientific Registry of Transplant Recipients. This is a uh, project that goes down from the Health Resource Service Administration through the OPTN, Organ Procurement and Transplant Network. And uh, it is uh, typically uh, performed by a, an organization that uh, contracts uh, for this uh, delivery and the analysis of the outcomes. And this is the SRTR uh, and the generated product on transplant outcomes, patient survivals, and the activity that comes out with that. And um, for the past uh, year and a half or so, or two years, uh, the SRTR has been administered by the uh, Chronic Renal Disease Group of the uh, Minneapolis uh, Medical Research Foundation. And today we are very uh, fortunate to have Dr. Ajay Israni, uh, who is the Deputy Director of the SRTR uh, um, uh, currently. And Dr. Israni is a transplant nephrologist. He's an adjunct professor at the University of Minnesota Hennepin Medical Center. And um, he also has many interests in outcomes and epidemiology. He's got an extensive background in that area and has also an interest in uh, genetic uh, epidemiology as well. And uh, today he's going to be talking to us on the program specific reports, how to look at this, the reports, how to uh, utilize them in a manner that helps you optimize outcomes, and he will also uh, field some questions on the uh, uh, value of SRTR and the future of SRTR as well. Dr. Estrani. Thank you all for coming. So I'm going to be talking about uh, improving the program-specific reports produced by the SRTR. So first I'll talk about the role of the SRTR in organ transplantation. Um, I'll talk next about the history of the SRTR contractors, role in, of SRTR in quality improvement, and give you results uh, in the last half hour about the consensus conference that we had on improving program-specific reports. So as you can see here, SRTR is in the middle. Uh, we are a contract uh, contractor that work for HRSA uh, for their Department of Transplantation. Uh, HRSA has two contractors, one that manages the SRTR, the other one is UNOS, which operates OPTN, and OPTN is composed of all transplant centers and organ procurement organizations. Transplant centers and organ procurement organizations send data to SRTR. Uh, we have a technical advisory committee that advises us, and we provide data to candidates, to recipients, living donors, investigators, and the public and also back to the transplant centers and the organ procurement organizations. So all this activity is uh, uh, under the Secretary of Health and Human Services, which also uh, operates CMS. So here's the history of uh, SRTR contractors. Prior to 2000, SRTR was within UNOS, and uh, from 2000 to 2010, it was Arbor Research Collaborative for Health, and in 2010, uh, we received the contract here at Minneapolis Medical Research Foundation. So where is Minneapolis Medical Research Foundation? We are part of uh, Hennepin Health System. Um, it is a 300 plus physician healthcare provider group which practices at Hennepin County Medical Center in Minneapolis and all the faculty are faculty of the University of Minnesota. So we have uh, MMRF which is essentially the nonprofit research arm of uh, Hennepin Health System and the Physician Group, and Chronic Disease Research Group is one part of MMRF, and the SRTR contract was awarded to CDRG MMRF. <coughs> so here are some of the folks that are uh, affiliated with SRTR. So uh, the director is uh, Dr. Kaziski. I'm the deputy director. We have biostatisticians and epidemiologists that work with us uh, in at MMRF. We also have senior staff for each of the organs, and these senior staff are not necessarily at University of Minnesota. Uh, some of them can be outside also. So, for example, for liver, we have Dr. Ray Kim, who's from Mayo uh, Clinic in Rochester, and Dr. Peter Stock, who's at UCSF. 
we also have the senior staff for lung, for all the other organs, pancreas, heart, kidneys, pediatrics, histocompatibility, health services, and also for simulated allocation modeling. So the activity of SRTR that we'll talk a lot about today is, uh, is something that we do as per the final rule, which is the reporting requirements that are listed in the final rule. And according to this, the d uh, data that we have to provide shall include measures of inter-transplant program variation. Uh, we have to show risk-adjusted total life years pre and post-transplant, the risk-adjusted patient and graft survival rates. And I'll spend a lot of time showing you the risk-adjusted patient and graft survival rates, uh, how we do that. Um, we also have to uh, show data on risk-adjusted waiting time and risk-adjusted transplantation rates. We also have to show uh, data regarding patients who were inappropriately kept off the list or retained on the waiting list as per the final rule, So, which is quite challenging to do. Um, the main thing is basically the SRTR is a responsibility for monitoring outcomes. And uh, we are monitoring for statistical deviations uh, between programs and within programs over time. And the, the pros of doing that is that you can monitor any measurable outcome, uh, and it can be objective. The problem is that it can be difficult to implement and can lack statistical power. So, for example, you can imagine if all the transplant centers were doing great, and they all were doing, you know, had great, like, 99 or 100% survival, uh, of patients and allografts. You can, you, you immediately have a problem. You don't have the power to detect differences anymore. So there are some challenges with, with doing this. So what is the role of SRTR in terms of monitoring outcomes? So uh, we get data from the OPTN. We get data from other sources. And the data that's collected by the OPTN, which is the transplant centers and organ procurement organizations, all that data is, uh, has some limited audits that are done on that data by UNOS OPTN, and it's then provided to SRTR. We also get data from other sources, such as the Social Security Death Master file from CMS, uh, which tells us if someone has, uh, has developed ESRD or has died after developing ESRD, and this is the same data that United States Renal Data System also gets. SRTR uses this data, and we provide the program-specific reports that we create and all our raw data to University of Michigan, the KEC, con the KEC, which is the contractor for CMS. So CMS is essentially saying this, seeing the same program-specific reports that we, are that we are creating and also seeing all the raw data. We also put out the program-specific uh, reports. Um, all, we look at all programs. Uh, we look at death and graft failure. Uh, we have the ability of doing this every three months, but generally it's only twice a year that we put it out publicly. And this data is provided to OPTN's uh, MPSC, which is the Membership Professional uh, 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 Standards Committee. So this is what the metric that MPSC uses, the Membership Professional Standards Committee. They look at large centers, and large centers is defined by having 10 or more transplants in a two-and-a-half-year cohort, and they look at one-year patient and graft survival. And they, they look at uh, these three criteria in order to flag a center for more scrutiny. And Basically, the three criteria, that you have to have all these three criteria. One is your observed minus expected events. These events are graft and patient failure uh, and, uh, or, or patient debt separately. Uh, if your observed minus expected is more than three or your observed over expected is more than one, greater than 1.5, that means you have more than 50% more uh, observed failures than expected and you have a, p, a one-sided p-value of less than 0.05. Uh, keep in mind that MPSC uses this one-sided p-value, but if you go to our website and look at the SRTR reports, we use a two-sided p-value. So essentially, you can just divide that in half, and that's what MPSC uses. Um, for smaller centers, th these are really small centers, less than 10 transplants in a two-and-a-half-year cohort. And, and this is, you see this, you know, if you're doing pediatric transplants, uh, certain types of transplants, you'll see quite... Uh, many of these small centers in that arena. 
they have to have at least one event in a two and a half year cohort and a new event in the subsequent year. And if you meet these criteria, then uh, you get flagged by the MTSC for more, sh for more scrutiny. So uh, like I said, uh, this is a PSR that we create and every six months we release this data publicly on the web and uh, for everybody to see. So this is our website, www.srtr.org. And uh, what we tell you is, uh, as on, you see on this website, uh, we tell you where to find these uh, transplant program reports. Uh, we also show the background and methodology as to how to do it. And we also show the risk adjusted models. So basically we, we, the, this, what it does, it shows what is being tested uh, essentially in these PSRs. So just to uh, get a sense, have, has anybody sort of looked at these risk adjusted models? Can I just have a show of hands? Okay, quite a few, that's great. Okay, so this is uh, where I practice at Hennepin County Medical Center and this is just showing you the graph survival um, um, at, uh, uh, at, uh, in the kidney program. And you can see here the one month, the one year, and the three year. Uh, and also you can see this center as worse, uh, compared to United States, the whole country. Uh, you can see the number of transplants, uh, the number of uh, observed uh, graft survival in this period, the number expected based on national experience. And you can also see uh, whether the observed or expected is significantly different uh, based on the p-value and looking at these confidence intervals. And it tells you whether it's statistically different or not. And so we do this for every single transplant center uh, in the country. But before we sort of put this out in the public, uh, we release some information uh, through the secure SRTR uh, website, which is the secure SRTR transplant HRSA.gov. And um, so if you go to this website, you log in, uh, you have to be a transplant center to log in to, into the secure website. And basically what we do is before we put out the report, we create the report, we put out something called a missing data report, a worksheet. Essentially it tells you, okay, this is the data on which that we're going to create the next PSRs. And this is all the patients. And these are their events. And these are the types of patients you have in this group. These are the risk factors. And if anything is missing or is marked as um, uh, other or something like that, those all things are, are sort of shown there. So just a show of hands, how many people have looked at uh, your center's missing data report? Okay, two people, that, two, three people. That's good because, you know, it's, it's not meant for public consumption. It's really meant for the people that are working on, on sort of the uh, checking the integrity of the data and the quality of the data. Okay, so we do this and then the PSR is created. And after the PSR is created, we put out this, the, these CQI tools, or quality improvement tools. And the, it's called the CQI spreadsheet. I've heard to use wor uh, worksheet, uh, essentially a calculator. And again, it's only available on the secure website. And so for example, uh, for our, my center, I'd look at the deceased donor graft survival data one year after transplant. These are adults only. It <coughs> tells you what cohort that you're looking at, and this is kind of the, what the calculator would be like. It would show you the, the one, you're looking at one year outcomes, looking at the number of transplants, this is the expected survival, this is the uh, observed survival, and it's showing me uh, the p-value is small, but the observed to expected, the ratio is uh, less than 1.5, um, and the observed minus expected is not greater than three, so I mean, I'm not gonna get flagged. Um, but also it tells me all the patients that are included in this, uh, in this PSR report, how many days they're followed, whether they had a failure, that event is one means they failed, then did they fail, that graft failed, or they died. And it also shows me some of the risk factors, such as did the donor have diabetes, was it missing, was it available, did they have hypertension, was it a DCD donor or not. So all this information is there. And the idea of, of having this calculator is that if, if you uh, are taking care of patients, then you can see, okay, why did I get flagged? Is it because of a certain group of patients, high-risk group of patients that I do? And what this calculator allows you to do is you can turn those high-risk patients off, and then you can see what your observed or expected is. 
using the same SRTR models that, that, that we use, and you can see whether you're still uh, being flagged or not if you remove these high-risk patients. So just a show of hands, how many have played with this uh, worksheet? I, I don't, uh, okay. So, yeah, it, it, again, it's not, not released publicly. It's only for the transplant center, and only the transplant center can log in to, to look at this. And you can only look at your own center's uh, spreadsheet. Okay, so uh, the other thing that we do is we play a role in RFI, Request for Information. This is the standardized data that centers submit to the payers. Uh, if there is an interest in submitting something to the payers, uh, we work with OPTN to release the information to insurance providers. So, you know, as I said, uh, we got the contract in 2010, and one of the questions that we ask is how can the system be improved? Um, and so we had a consensus conference. Uh, we, we had uh, uh, this in Arlington, Virginia in February of this year, and uh, um, we actually had this co-chaired by Dr. Kaczynski representing SRTR and Maureen McBride representing OPTN UNOS. And we were lucky to have on the steering committee um, uh, some very important stakeholders. We had representation from AST, ASTS, from CMS, ACOT, which is an advisory committee of transplantations to the, to the Secretary of Health and Human Services. We had a, a patient representative. Um, we also had private uh, I insurers, uh, we had representation from Optum Health on the steering committee. Uh, we had different committees of the OPTN, the transplant administrators, the MPSC, the perform uh, PACE or the performance uh, uh, PACE committee, and the policy oversight committee, the POC. So we had all these stakeholders that were on the steering committee to, to help us create this consensus conference. And so the questions that we posed to the steering committee and to the consensus conference were these. You know, what is the SRTR's mandate? Uh, who uses PS, PSRs and why do they use it? Uh, are there any unintended consequences of the PSRs? And what can we learn from, uh, uh, from others? Because remember, we're not the only ones that are creating report cards. There are lots of people, if you talk to other specialties, they have their own report cards that they create and, and they're doing it differently. So we wanted to learn from that. Uh, what are the statistical methods that we should use? Uh, because this is, again, like I said, we're not the only ones creating report cards. A lot of other folks are doing it in other specialties, too. And what should we risk adjust for? What outcomes should we use? And what data should we collect? So um, I think I've covered the SRTR mandate uh, and already because it's really determined by the final rule. So I'm just going to talk a little bit more about these other bullets and sort of highlight the discussions that we had uh, at this consensus conference. And then I'll show you what some of the recommendations that we got from this consensus conference. And the idea is that these recommendations are essentially a roadmap in how to improve the program-specific reports. So CMS was at this uh, consensus conference. Uh, Thomas Hamilton was there from CMS. And basically, the CMS intent was backing up OPTN and uh, it backing up the center's voluntary quality assurance program. And uh, their idea was that you had OPTN outcomes, then you had CMS action. So OPTN outcomes are in this column, CMS actions, and CMS outcomes. So this is what uh, outcomes might come out if CMS is involved. So if OPTN outcome is successful, and basically the outcomes are good, there's no need for CMS action. Uh, if the OPTN outcome is uh, it's ongoing, they're still working with the center to make it better, CMS might intervene, and uh, they might go through any of these three processes. So let's talk about these three processes. So there's a mitigating factors approval. So if you can show CMS that, okay, I am taking care of some high-risk patients and, and risk factors that are not accounted for in, in the SRTR models, well, then that's a mitigating factors report that you can file with CMS. And just talking to some centers, they have been quite successful if they were doing, you know, positive cross-match, ABO incompatible, because those are things that we can't account for in these models carefully. And, and so there they have been centers that have been able to do this. However, um, if after that things are not going well and outcomes are not getting better, the OPTN outcomes, and CMS might uh, 
uh, take action and they may ask for assistance system improvement agreement and these are again things that you work out with CMS and can be quite expensive unfortunately um, if uh, the, again CMS uh, OPTN is again not successful and not involved anymore CMS action can still be there and they may step in and, and ask the program to be terminated This was OPTN's perspective. They're interested in improving outcomes and the PACE outcome review activity. This is uh, Alan, Dr. Alan Reed presented this. Uh, he looked at the number of centers that his committee is looking, his, is sort of reviewing the activity in December 2011. And these are the different organ transplant centers, number of programs in the country, and essentially these are the number of programs under PACE review. 18% uh, of kidney, around 19% of liver, 15 heart, 25 lung, these are large volume centers and small volume centers. Keep in mind that, um, you know, they, when a PSR comes out and a center is flagged, they work with that center for a long period of time until the outcomes get better. So essentially it could take, you know, if, if you are just, if you, even if you improve your outcomes, it might take a while for those centers' outcomes to get better. And so that's why they keep accumulating a large number of centers. Even though we flag about only about 5% of centers, uh, they are still working with these centers that were flagged previously. So they have a larger number of centers that they're working with. What is it's, a, it's a performance uh, improvement subcommittee of the MPSC. So basically if a center gets flagged, uh, PACE is the one group subcommittee that works with that center to see what you know, what are the reasons why the outcomes are not good? What can they do to improve things? This is oh yeah, this is the UNOS OPTN subcommittee. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. And we, like I said, we had private uh, uh, insurance companies there, private providers, payers, and their perspective is that basically the transplantation is a complex, rare condition, and this is the what they want to see is that the quality move so that it move uh, for their patients to, be, to move to the, to the right, to the better side, basically by having centers of excellence that they can refer their patients to, so that th what they're trying to do is shift their patient traffic to these high quality centers, and they want to reward and inspire exceptional clinical performance through this center of excellence. That was their perspective. We had programs, uh, we had representation for many programs there, and basically programs wanted to make sure they were competitive in the local market and also provide good outcomes and take care of patients, including high-risk patients, and be able to do that. We had some uh, talks there uh, from Dr. Howard. He's really looked uh, quite a bit at the patient's perspective. How do patients look at report cards? And this is just from uh, uh, Best Hospitals US News and uh, US News, News Rankings. And on, uh, there's some r research that has shows that rankings on average account for a change in 5% of the non-emergency Medicare patients in each of the hospital subspecialties each year. So if a hospital is ranked high, you can expect to see something like 5% increase uh, in, that, uh, in the referrals or in the patients coming to your center. Uh, Dr. Howard and, and uh, uh, Dr. Kaplan have looked at this, in looking at the impact of the PSRs in transplantation, and what they found is a number of deceased donor registrants choosing centers as a function of PSRs over a five-year period. They looked at this uh, 1999 to 2002, and they found the PSRs had no effect except in certain subgroups, so younger patients, ages 18 to 40, and patients with a college degree. So basically, pretty sophisticated crowd that's going onto the internet, looking at these reports and saying, okay, which center do I want to go to? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, uh, this is pretty old stuff, and, and the presentation is changing. And as a matter of fact, we, we want to make it, we have a feature now it's to, for a patient to go to the, uh, a transplant center near me so that they can actually also look at it by how close, how far, you know, what's the closest center and, you know, what are the outcomes. And then also if they don't like those outcomes, they can go further and uh, look further beyond. Yeah, so that's still a work in progress is how to present this for patients. And, and as you'll see, one of the recommendations 
from the PSR consensus conference specifically relates to that also. So the question is, are, we discussed uh, at the consensus conference, are there unintended consequences of the PSRs? And this is uh, Dr. Jesse Schultz has done quite a bit of work in this field. And what he did was he actually did an informal survey of, of uh, transplant administrators. And uh, what he asked them, uh, he asked administrators from centers with low performance, that's a dark bar, uh, and centers with, without low performance. And he asked them, you know, uh, are you going to have uh, increased internal monitoring? And uh, what he found was the centers that had low performance were more likely to report that they would. Uh, are you going to have increased patient selection criteria? Um, basically, you're going to get more picky about who you select. And patient, the centers with low performance said, the administrator said they were more likely to do this. Uh, are you going to have increased donor organ selection criteria? Basically, are you going to get picky about what donors you select? And again, centers with low performance are more likely to, their administrators are more likely to state that. And are you going to alter your clinical protocols? And again, centers with low performance, their administrators are more likely to state this. Uh, at this uh, consensus conference, we also had uh, data that was presented by the SRTR and some of the analysis that we had done. Um, we showed uh, that, you know, this is an, uh, we just showed it in kidney, for example, uh, includes kidney pancreas transplant, that what you've seen is that since uh, this is 2006, the CMS condition uh, of participation, basically they started using the PSR reports to flag centers, that basically came into play in March 30, 2007. The PSRs were there before, but really CMS sort of said, okay, we're now going to start flagging centers, and they started this in 2007. And you can see that the number of transplants uh, have sort of leveled off uh, since then. But the number of uh, new patients uh, that are added, these are just the new patients, we keep adding them, and the number of patients that are on a waiting list in a given year, by each year, they keep increasing. So this hasn't been affected you know, by anything that happened in 2007. So those numbers keep rising. And there was more analysis that we presented which showed that, you know, since the uh, condition of participation, again, it's really been close to 5% of centers that are being flagged. Uh, and uh, previously it was just MPSC flagging, and after 2007 it was MPSC and CMS that were starting to use this PSRs for flagging purposes. And it's really been sort of the steady 5%. And uh, essentially the conclusion that some of the analysis that we showed was there was a lack of growth in transplant numbers in 2006, uh, anecdotal evidence of programs becoming more selective since implementation of the CMS uh, uh, condition of participation. However, if you look at the effect of flagging on the transplant center volume at one year post-flagging, it was kind of minimal. So if you look at centers that are flagged or not flagged, and you looked at them over a whole time frame, there really wasn't that much change. But remember that we just looked at the one-year transplant volume. That's all we looked at. Uh, so it's difficult to conclude or exclude that there's apparent leveling off in transplant volumes due to these conditions of participation. And again, we could not look at listing behavior or longer time trends, and they may have been affected by condition of participation. So it's, it's hard to say at this point. But this is something that you know we, we want. We're cautious about. We want to be careful about, and we want to monitor it on an ongoing basis. So at the consensus conference, we also said, what can we learn from others? Because remember, we're not the only people that are putting out these report cards. And uh, we looked at uh, uh, what the thoracic surgery societies are doing, and uh, basically the Society of Thoracic Surgeons, uh, they have a national adult cardiac surgery database. They have risk models for cabbage, valve procedures, and both. And uh, the Iowa Foundation for Medical Care audits uh, th these uh, data. Uh, they started doing public release of the data starting in 2010. And they came up with the composite score. So they looked at adjusted operative mortality, adjusted morbidity. So they're not just looking at whether a patient died, but they also want to look, did you develop renal failure? Did you develop stroke? Did you have a sternal infection? Do you have reoperation for cardiac causes? Did you have prolonged ventilation? Uh, they wanted to see you, did, did, what kind of process measures were involved, not just outcomes, but did you use the internal mammary? Did you use periodic beta blockers? Uh, were the patients discharged on antiplatelet agents? Were they discharged on antilipid agents? And did they were, were they discharged on beta blockers? 
So this is what their society decided to use as, uh, an, a, you know, for their report card essentially. And what was also very interesting is how they presented it so that the patients could understand the report card. And this is something that was very interesting. Um, so this is the um, quality domain. This is overall score. This is the avoidance of mortality, avoidance of morbidity, and use of internal memory artery and medications. And they gave a score, and they gave you the mean uh, post-operative score, and they gave you a star rating. So patients, you know, people can understand stars. So if you're a three star, you're better than a one star. And so they've changed their report card to also show stars so patients can understand this. They also showed the distribution of the participant scores. So they showed all the scores, and they said this hospital here falls in, is, is in this range. And they did this, did this overall, and also for each of these measures, they were able to show this. Uh, so whether you used, uh, did you avoid mortality, did you avoid morbidity, uh, did you use internal memory, and what kind of meds did you use? So, uh, so this was kind of eye-opening for us because, I mean, this is uh, much more uh, detailed-oriented in the sense it's not just outcomes. They're actually looking at process measures. So uh, sort of putting all that together, then we had, we had breakout groups. And uh, one, the first group was uh, statistical methods, what should we use? And this was headed by Dr. Gaston and Dr. Stuart Street, Sweet. Uh, and uh, these were the chairs of uh, this group. And um, uh, basically, the, uh, some of the, I'll go back to that slide in a minute. Some of the recommendations that this group came up with is that uh, the PSR should be better suited to the needs of all users, particularly patients. So, for example, regulatory agencies, they want to know which centers require further scrutiny. Uh, whereas private payers want to know, you know, which centers, they want to identify over and underperforming centers. Because if you have overperforming, they want to send patients there. Uh, patients want to know which centers transplant patients like me. So uh, they, they basically, the recommendation was that they wanted PSRs tailored to target users and to provide additional information depending on the type of user that you're trying to target. Uh, the other thing was that rather than refitting these PSR models every six months, the time between revisions should be increased and used more carefully to review the models and the data elements. So right now what we do is every six months we, we sort of have this, um, we do minor changes to the PSR m uh, model every six months. The covariates are the same, but they change a little bit in terms of their strength. And we put that model up on the website, but the idea was that maybe we should actually not do that every six months, but actually maybe we should do more extensive re-examination every three to five years with input from the transplant community uh, and from the SRTR's uh, uh, technical advisory committee. The, the idea is that uh, you look at, you know, how has the field changed? Maybe we should be looking at other factors that are not in the models, and maybe you should have much better, closer re-examination of these models. Does that mean that if you were flagged, that something that you may be able to get out of in six to 12 months, you would now take three years to get out of? The published data for the people looking at it to see if you only go back to the data every couple of years. No, I think um, this is more in terms of, you know, like say, if you, um, things change in the field. Uh, so for example, there are types of patients that we transplant now that we never used to transplant in the past. So it has, has nothing to do with the flagging, but more in terms of as you create new reports that you take into account more of the things that, or more of the types of patients that you're transplanting now than you did say like five years ago, you know? So is it when you refit the model every six months, like just that most recent six months data or it's only a rolling window? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's so done on every six months. Right, same covariates. And what this, what this, this recommendation was that maybe don't do it that every six months, but maybe do an in-depth look every three to five years. And when you do that in-depth look, see how does the field change? Is there more things that we need to account for that were not accounted for because we never did these type of transplants three to five years ago? So, and so essentially, um, I'll get back to that, but basically this is kind of the, the f you could sort of divide up the organs uh, into you know a cycle 
where every year you take on one or two organs and you could divide up into half a year you look at heart, half a year you look at lung, next year you look at liver, next kidney and third year you do pancreas or something along those lines. But you really sort of do an in-depth look, work with the transplant community, work with maybe the, the, the specific uh, uh, organ committees of OPTN and sort of see, okay, what are the things that are not in this model that should be in this model and, and really take a uh, sort of deeper look at this. The other thing that, uh, uh, the third recommendation was the potential benefits of hierarchical and mixed effects models should be studied. And again, uh, I'm, I'm going to show you more information on that. And these are the types of models actually that the, um, the thoracic society has moved towards. And uh, so basically the idea is that these hierarchical models uh, uh, with suggested performance criteria, they can better account for center effects. Um, and basically they improve the accuracy of the distribution, uh, uh, the middle of the distribution, uh, uh, and uh, it, so they might be better for sort of reporting for to the public. So what you could do with this is here's a paper from 1997, so nothing new and fancy. This has actually been out there for quite a bit, this methodology. Um, but uh, is if you look, this is your population rate of mortality, and this is not for transplant, this is for just uh, another uh, type of uh, procedure. And you can look that, you know, that you sort of have this true mortality rate which increases as you go to the right. The population rate is, say, 0.02, and you can come up with a cutoff saying, you know, the transplant community can come up with a cutoff saying, you know, if you have a rate of mortality at one year that's over, say, 0.03, maybe something's not right. This, this needs to be scrutinized further. And then you could use that information, and these are, say, like three hospitals in this case they've shown here, and one hospital is clearly working, you know, uh, at a mortality rate. These are adjusted rates. The, their adjusted rate is less than the population rate, so obviously they're, they're doing something okay. And whereas you have H2, this is other hospital, which is sort of on the higher end of the population rate. So it maybe needs a little bit more scrutiny maybe. And again, this is the strategy that the Society of Thoracic Surgeons have used in their risk-adjusted models uh, for outcomes after thoracic surgery. The other recommendation that the statistical group had was provide transplant centers with tools like QSUM. Uh, these are cumulative sum techniques and tools to, performing, to perform subgroup analysis to facilitate quality assessment and performance improvement. And one of the criticisms of the PSRs is that it comes out every six months. And um, so there is an inherent delay, and we're looking at a two-and-a-half-year cohort. So essentially the transplants you did, you know, a year ago is what you're going to be, you're being judged on right now. And what this does, QSUM, is, is really a process control method that yields more timely results. And QSUM graphically depicts, uh, you know, collected risk-adjusted uh, data and alerts the users when you s uh, sort of have uh, when the outcome reaches a predetermined threshold value. So if you have too many failures and you know you, you sort of set a threshold and you say, oh wait a minute, something's wrong. You know I'm getting more failures now, and and you know in real time that that there there there's a problem that's occurring. So um, basically, tr uh, QSUM can identify underperforming centers sooner. Uh, and have and, and actually it's a better quality control instrument than the PSRs. It's useful for monitoring outcomes and they've actually used it in UK quite a bit but they only have about 27 centers in the whole country that they're following. So if you have a small group of centers you can actually do this. Uh, but, and, but it really depends on obtaining data, uh, outcome data, more quickly and a more timely manner. So it, what it would do is encourage centers to collect their data, to follow their patients closer, and to collect the data uh, sooner. And you really need a lot of education of centers on how to use this type of tool uh, in order to benefit them. So the other recommendation was uh, consider increasing the observed to expected threshold or using sliding scale p-values to monitor outcomes at small volume centers equitably. So we realize that you know at small centers the power to detect uh, differences is it's it's very diff it's it's difficult and we don't have much power, and one could argue that the the center volume itself is an indicator of quality, and so 
this recommendation was to work with MPSC and sort of change the p-value that we use, that, uh, or 0.05 that we use for larger centers. It may not be the right sort of uh, threshold for smaller centers, and maybe they should have a different threshold. This is a QSIM uh, that has been implemented by uh, Dr. Axelrod, and he's published this in 2009. And the idea is that he compared QSIM with PSRs for flagging 100 kidney transplant programs. And you can see that the PSRs, it flags fewer centers, where the QSIM does flag more centers uh, and more quickly. So you can see that these years are much less than the years over here. Um, so there is some benefit to using QSIM, but you really need to have sort of real-time data, and the six-month lag doesn't really kind of work uh, that we have in the PSR models. Another sort of idea that was actually floated at the consensus conference is these funnel plots. And you can sort of see that the dashed lines are the 95% limit. Uh, this is observed uh, and expected data that you see for graph failures. And what you can see is if a center, each of these dots is a center, the center goes outside of the 95% limit, that you can sort of get an idea that, okay, you know, you can give you a sense of where your center is also uh, compared to the rest of the centers. So this is another way of sort of uh, looking at all centers together. The statistical group also had some recommendations in terms of mortality data from the Social Security uh, Administration death master files should be continued to be available to SRTR. So as you may or may not know, in November 2011, uh, the Social Security Administration began removing debts reported by states. So if anything from the state data, they started removing it from the Social Security death master file. And so this is estimated to have reduced the number of debts that uh, uh, are listed in the Social Security death master file by about a third. So a third of the debts would be unaccounted for. And the decision has serious consequences um, for the accuracy of the observed to expected calculations in the PSRs. So we're working with HRSA to try to uh, work with the Social Security uh, death master file uh, data so that we can get all the data, even the deaths that are reported by the states. Uh, it was thought to be a sort of a privacy issue. You know, it's, it's state data. Um, again, it, it was these privacy rules that have been passed, I guess, and they felt that, uh, you know, the state data does not uh, belong in there. So. Uh, I don't quite understand, <laughs> and I don't quite agree either. So, the uh, SRTR should. Uh, this was another recommendation that was uh, of interest: is that SRTR should substitute missing values, missing data with values that are least favorable. Uh, basically, uh, that would yield sort of uh, uh, the uh, the best outcomes. So, basically, what they were trying to say is that if a center doesn't report a variable, you you put it you put the, don't put it as missing but you code it as like the worst possible thing that, uh, that could, uh, I should say, the, the, the variable that it should be coded such that it gives you the best possible outcome in terms of patient survival and graph survival. So it would actually work against the center to just put missing down as a default. And so essentially the idea was that centers would be, uh, uh, they would encourage centers to accurately record data and should um, consider including timeliness and completion of data submission as a quality indicator. The uh, uh, last recommendation from this group was to avoid the conversion of continuous data elements to categorical elements and to use splines at instances where the continuous variables were not appropriate. The idea is that to just maximize the data that you have uh, using as much continuous data elements as you can. The next working group that we had uh, was the uh, risk adjustment group. This was chaired by Drs. Mitch Henry and Dennis Irwin. And they were trying to sort of seek a balance between how much is too much risk adjustment and how much is, is not enough. So the idea is that if you adjust for too much, basically you could be sort of encouraging futile transplants. So uh, basically you would take a high-risk person knowing very well that this person is not going to do well, there's not going to be a good outcome, but because it's risk adjusted, you, the center would do that. Uh, the idea is that the organs, then you're taking away organs from patients that could do really well and have a m much larger benefit. Um, the, idea, uh, the other spectrum is if you don't do enough risk adjustment, 
then you have decreased recipient access. So you're sort of, it will, it will cause centers to walk away or shun patients that are high risk. Uh, just because they're not risk adjusted, they would not do those kind of transplants. So that's the other extreme. And it would also decrease donor utilization. So if you have a high risk donor, and because those donor factors are not adjusted for in the model, centers might say, no, I don't want this donor, it's too high risk a donor. So th there's so the idea is to what is the right balance and that's kind of what they were looking at. Uh, so again, you know you can collect more data to do better risk adjustment. The pros are that you can have a lot of risk adjustment. It's richer. Cons are you're putting a lot of burden on programs. Now they have to collect all this data. Um, you could also exclude or select normative samples. So you could exclude high risk patients from these PSR models, or you could just focus on normative sample. These are the sort of the normal risk patients. Uh, again, less burden on programs. The problem is that then you start having smaller sample sizes because you took away all the high risk patients or you're just looking at the normal risk patients and your sample size gets smaller and it gets kind of complex because now you have to decide, well, what is normal and what is high risk? So, so the recommendation that this working group, uh, you know, they dealt with all these issues that, that I talked about. So their recommendations were to consider protecting innovation by excluding patients who are in approved protocols from PSR models uh, in, in uh, identifying the underperforming centers. So basically you wanted to figure out which of these uh, innovative uh, sort of uh, protocols, patients that are in those protocols, they wouldn't be included in your PSR models. And so we are in early discussions between HRSA, MPSC, UNOS, and SRTR as to how we kind of do this. Obviously we need something uh, like a you know, ad hoc, uh, some sort of uh, uh, committee of the MPSC that's going to sort of look at these protocols and say, okay, this is truly a high risk protocol. And then they have to come up with, okay, what are the outcomes in these high risk patients that uh, need to be, they need to be defined, they need to be reported, but they just need to be reported separately from the PSR models. Uh, the other thing was to identify centers that manage high risk patients and donors well. Uh, the idea is that uh, we want to avoid inappropriately discouraging centers from providing transplant to high-risk patients, and we want to uh, in avoid inappropriately discouraging centers from using high-risk donors. And uh, we also want to allow patients to identify for themselves, okay, I'm a high-risk patient. What is a center that transplants patients like me? So this was, uh, this was sort of the, the, the reason for this recommendation. Uh, the other recommendation was adjusting, uh, was to collect more reliable organ-specific data on coronary heart disease, that's revascularizations, uh, peripheral vascular disease, revascularization, the amputations, diabetes, uh, zip code, socioeconomic status, donor risk, and for hearts, so it was whether the patient had a ventricular assist device before their transplant. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that you collect additional data uh, to more appropriately adjust for comorbidities. And the idea is that you remove disincentives from performing transplants in high-risk uh, patients who would otherwise are suitable candidates. Uh, the other recommendation was to provide more data on waitlist risk and outcomes. And um, currently, the PSRs really focuses a lot on post-transplant outcomes. And what patients really want to know is that they want to compare their experience on the waitlist. You know, if I go to this center, what is the experience going to be if I get on their waitlist? Versus if I go to the other center, what's the experience going to be if I go on their wait list? Uh, what is the time frame for me to get a transplant? Uh, what are the chances of dying while I'm waiting on, on the list? You know, because we know that not everybody who's on the waiting list for kidney, for example, is going to get a kidney transplant. Uh, the next uh, working group was focused on outcomes. What outcomes should be used? This was chaired by Dr. Alan Reed and Nancy Metzler. Uh, we asked this group to look at endpoints. You know, what endpoints should we consider? death, graft failure, uh, volume, should that be an important uh, uh, outcome, transplant rate, duration of the follow-up, you know, uh, obviously if you look at short outcomes, you get, uh, it's a reflection of what the center just did. If you look at lo longer outcomes, well, it's more important to the patients than, you know, the long-term outcomes. So we also uh, had this uh, group look at surrogate outcomes, should it be acute rejections, uh, or things that predict long-term outcomes. Uh, should it be comparison to not being transplanted? What if you don't transplant these patients? Just keep them on the way, you know, and they, they're just, they're not transplanted. What is their, 
what is their outcome going to be? So this is life years after transplant. That's is some should we be looking at that? Look at life quality of life adjustment and cost. So this group had certain recommendations. One was to enhance reporting of access to transplantation and pre-transplant outcomes. And basically, the uh, programs and patients are interested in the patient experience uh, before transplant and after transplant. And uh, one of the things that was thrown about was the composite pre-transplant metric, which actually combines the SRTR's weightless mortality, transplant rate, and organ acceptance rate. It combines all three of them together. Uh, but obviously, if you sort of see, the CPM of the composite pre-transplant metric is influenced by listing practices, uh, the geographic differences in organ availability, and factors that are really not under the control of a center oftentimes. The, this uh, outcomes group also re uh, sort of recommended reporting life years after listing. Uh, basically, the idea is that you portray the pre- and the post-transplant experience uh, for that center versus other centers. Uh, they also said consider reporting uh, transplant program risk tolerance. Uh, this was especially important for patients. They want to know what centers transplant high-risk patients like me. And peers want to know which centers are willing and able to accept high-risk patients and so that they can sort of send the high-risk patients to those centers. Uh, next was to improve monitoring and reporting of short-term living donor outcomes. And this was really sort of building on the consensus conference that was held in September 2010, which recommended that living donors, uh, their OPTN follow-up uh, information for three months after donation should be reported. Uh, next was to consider providing information on outcomes beyond three years post-transplant. Uh, and so basically the idea is that patients and peers are really interested in what happens to patients that are transplanted after three years, so long-term outcomes. How well do you think the, the average patient will be able to interpret the information that you have there beyond the start? Right. Uh, because we can give different patients data, but their interpretation may be poor right. uh, of what that really means. So I'm going to go ahead because they have 97%, but they do these patients. Your BMI is not really what they do, or they just keep you on the list and you're not really going to get transplanted. Or, you know, there's things that they see numbers, they can go with the 98% versus 92%. They're going to be in a better transplant center, who knows, but they can see that. Stars, they can see. There's right. a lot of nuance that we're talking about, and if it's made for them as well, are we giving them more than they can handle? Right, right. No, I think that's a valid question. Um, more information you give, you could overwhelm anybody, you know. Uh, so I think that's why I think one of the first recommendations that the statistical group had is that you need to provide the PSRs in a fashion that is suitable for patients, you know. So to, so obviously just the current format that we have won't do it because it's just all these tables and, you know, and numbers, and it's hard for patients to get that. So you need to have better ways to show some data to patients. Uh, so th it's obviously a challenge. It, this is That's why... I think this is uh, it's a great idea, but implementing this idea is going to take time if you want to do it, you know, properly. I think that's a good question. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's 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 what was very impressive is that the thoracic societies are putting out these stars, and I mean, it's it's uh, you know, and we've been doing uh, you know this for a while, but we haven't actually done what patients want to see, you know. I mean, you just give them numbers, and it's like, what does this mean? Right, like the movie. Yeah. No, patients yeah. can rely on the variable. I mean, so like, there's a lot of quality reporting in cardiology and whatnot, but like the big ACE inhibitors for heart failure. But you know, all the hospitals are within a you know a few percent. So, but there's still a ninety, a zero to ninety, you know, hundred percentile within a few actual percent. So, what does it mean to be one star versus five star when it all when it means it's ninety six versus ninety nine percent? Right. That That's like, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's very good, and that's why, yeah. Right. <laughs> so, so you need to have the stars, and you actually need to show the data next to it so that, you know, if you are a two-star and you're saying, okay, look at the difference between a two-star and three-star, really it's, this is what the, you know, you show the spread, and this is, this is where our center sits, you know. Yeah, it, it, these are, 
important questions, and uh, uh, we don't have answers to this, but this is really the challenge of the field. The last group, that working group, was data, what data should we collect, and it was Dr. John Roberts and Daniel Cornell, and they were looking at, you know, the process for deciding, okay, how do you figure out these variables, uh, what's a burden on programs as you collect this data, and the quality assurance uh, uh, of the data that you collect, and their recommendations, they had a lot of recommendations, this group, um, provide standard definitions and identify sources, uh, source documents for all data elements, examine data in the donor net, uh, see if that can be used, and even examine do data in CMS claims, for example. Can that be used to provide information on donor and organ quality? Um, survey transplant programs to better understand the data collection burden. This group was very sensitive to how much work, additional work do you want centers to do. Offer better education and data collection tools to assist programs in maintaining their OPTN data. Use the OPTN policy development process for adding new data elements. So not just add them randomly, but really sort of work through them carefully. Uh, like I said, this group had a lot of recommendations. So, uh, Assist programs in maintaining the OPTN data by educating programs about availability of tools. Uh, look at the SRTR private site, tie-dye, export, basically to bring in data in a one-shot swoop. Uh, examine missing data, improve the use utility of these tools. Develop enhancements to allow programs to more easily monitor their performance. Allow programs to more easily make corrections when problems are identified. And offer standardizing OPTN training for data entry, pers uh, entry personal and a certification process, which doesn't exist right now. So everybody uses different people to enter their data. Uh, this group also uh, wanted to develop, uh, use OPTN policy development process and follow strict criteria for adding new data elements. So there should be a reason for each data element that you add, how each data element will be used, a clear definition, so not everybody's making up their own definition, uh, source documentation requirements, appropriate populations, uh, and uh, minimizing unproductive data entry categories such as unknown or other, uh, and understanding the cost implications of, of collecting all this data. They wanted to explore the feasibility of building data collection interfaces with electronic medical records. So if you have an electronic otter, uh, or if you have a phoenix in the future, would it be possible to send that data directly to OPTN without manual entry? Um, consider allowing the cost of mandated uh, entry be placed on the Medicaid cost report for reimbursement and not limit this option to candidate registration form. And to consider providing information about paired exchange and, and telling centers which centers, which transplant centers actually do paired exchange so they can approach those centers. So it's a lot of recommendations, and uh, so SRTR is going to work with our technical advisory committee. We're going to work with HRSA, OPTN, CMS, and ACOT as we work on these recommendations, but it's basically given as a roadmap of what we need to do to make the PSRs better. All right, thank you. No. Um, what, how would you describe the support from the actual institutions. I know you have members of ASTS there and their, you know, representatives, uh, but they also represent the organization. But what about the, the, the groups in terms of, you're going to present data for everyone to see to describe how good, quote unquote, a program is. At least that's how it's going to be interpreted. And um, currently, people get uh, uh, patients to come based on location, ease of getting, and reputation, which could be a lot of things. Right. You can have an awesome cardiology program uh, that everybody knows and loves, or a good football team, and uh, somebody may want to go to that institution with nothing to do with data. Right. Um, how do the different programs think about that? Do they want to change how it's done now? Or they have a small program that nobody knows about has excellent data. They may be very interested, but a big program that had a few challenges, do uh, you, you get support from them, or does it not matter if you get support from them? I, I think uh, so the question is, you know, uh, how do they essentially the transplant centers view all these recommendations. I think that's, wh that's wh uh, what your c question is. Um, I think there was a consensus that there is need for improvement in the current PSR model. Uh, th there's a lot that needs to be, there's a lot of improvement that can be made. Uh, and we heard this from centers, uh, from people that were talking on behalf of patients, uh, and also, I think uh, um, there were folks that felt that the current system is not 
uh, serving them as well because it doesn't include some of these risks uh, that centers are taking now that they never did, you know, five years ago, for example. And uh, so, th so there is an interest in making this process better. A and looking at what, say, other groups are doing, such as the Thoracic Society, um, I think there was definitely an interest in, in making this better. Uh, we, we, but there was, again, you know, the devil's in the details. And so now I think the process, w what I think everybody would agree that the process needs to be open and transparent and, and people to see what's coming. And that's why I think this consensus conference is good. As a matter of fact, all these, this, this manuscript is on the uh, AT, um, AJT website. So it's in press, but it's actually on that website right now, this whole manuscript. So everybody can see these are the recommendations. This is where we need to go to. And again, uh, it would be up to the SRTR to make sure that all these are um, sort of uh, changes are discussed and shown to the community before they're implemented. had sort of a bigger, better model that would encourage people to take more risk, and, and, and we don't want to encourage that necessarily. But I'm wondering, is, it, is that really the right place for that to be even be a consideration? Meaning that, you know, if the model is more accurate, why, that should intrinsically be a good thing. Now, the, the burden of collecting more data is definitely a downside to having a bigger model. But if the model's more accurate, whether you, you still would identify over or underperforming centers, isn't that a separate question than, what you want the outcomes to be, which is a policy question rather than a, is this center good or bad or doing a good job or doing a bad job? And you're, if you had a better model, for example, the center, individual center could learn from that, meaning are we selecting high-risk patients? And you get some of that already, but if the model doesn't capture it even better than now, is it that we're selecting high-risk patients or are we underperforming on the patients we have? And I think we all feel that the model, you know, or yeah, at times you feel like the model can't, and it can't, models can't account for everything, but if it's, significantly better, I mean, why wouldn't you make it, I don't know, it just seems to me to be maybe not the right place for that to be a counterbalance. And yeah, I, I think you have to be careful. You, you just don't want to add more things to a model just because it, you know, uh, it works a tad bit better. Because now you've added a lot of burden on the center to collect all this information just to make it a tad bit better. So, so I think that there is a balancing act. Right, right, right. Right. Yeah, yeah. You, you're right. I think I think that I was on that seesaw that I was showing was the extremes. You know, you can make it so good that you could sort of have futile transplants, uh, or you could make it so lousy that you know they just turn away patients just because they're high risk. So, but I think the truth lies in between, where you want to have a model where people are willing, centers are willing to take risks, high risk patients, and not turn them away. But at the same time, you don't want to collect so much data that it's like too much, you know, burden. So I think if you make it good enough, you can make that the criteria. So then you can help, you know, not select those futile patients. But then you still identify centers that do well, that are doing well, but they might have a different, you know, patient mix. Right. Right. Yeah. I think right now, I would say I don't think we have to worry about making it th that extreme of futile transplants. I don't think we're there yet. Hi, um, thanks for the talk. The, uh, um, you know, Tom Hamilton actually get, came here uh, last month, and I think that his, the theme of his talk was that CMS wasn't there to really judge the program, but to try to improve the program. And it seems like when the SRTR first started, that was also the intent of the SRTR, is to improve transplant programs. As the payers have sort of gotten involved, and as you know, you're, you're, as you went, went through this, it sounds almost as if the SRTR is now moving towards sort of judging programs and putting stars and rating programs. Is that the purpose of the SRTR now? Is that what we're moving towards? Or are we going, are we going to try to do what more CMS is trying to do, which is trying to um, improve patient outcomes and center outcomes? Right. No, I, I think our goal is to improve outcomes. It's just once you put the data out, there are a lot of unintended consequences of the data that you put out, the reports that you put out. And how people use them, you have no idea like, you know, we, I, we wouldn't have known that this is what private payers are going to do with this data, is just drop people from, oh, you're not, no longer, we're not going to send you any patients, you know? So uh, uh, there are unintended consequences, and that's why I think the SRTR has to be careful as to what 
model they select, you know, how do they put it out, and, and, and sort of describe all the caveats around those models too. So it's, it's a good question. Uh, SRTR, I think our mandate is by the final rule is just to show the risk-adjusted outcomes, you know. Uh, but we have to be careful because there are a lot of unintended consequences when you put out any of that data. Yeah, no, that's a very good question. I, I think, again, our, we're driven by the final rule, but we have to, there's a side of this. When you put out, this is your risk-adjusted outcomes, and this is all the risk-adjusted outcomes in the country, you know, uh, what people do with that data and what private payers do is, is out of your control, essentially. Yeah, and, and I agree with you. The STARS is good for patients, but you're right. I mean, has you're, you're essentially, uh, you could create, problems, again, had unintended consequences, that is not the, the goal of, of the SRTR. From the uh, uh, quality perspective, the SRTR is a simplification, perhaps a quality improvement tool. Uh, we know that you have the data every quarter analyzed. Why don't programs get this data confidentially every quarter of the process and provide additional alternatives where you can look at your data and S smaller cohorts as you, you do the six months of yearly segments and then provide maybe a gateway for CQI tools that are more secure for transplant centers to look at their own data and massage it. Is that right, true? right. And I think that's where the QSUM came into place is that QSUM is more continuous. It's not just even three months. Because remember, um, before we put out a report, we ask, we send out this one report saying, this is your missing data. So that give, gives a month to clean up that process. Then you put out the report. Then you give them a month to put any comments in because there might be some things that were just not under the control of that center. So that itself, and then the third month you put it out. So, uh, and again, every six months we were refitting these models too. So the time frame just doesn't allow to put this out every three months. But I think the QSIM is something that it's even more continuous than three months. It's it's in real time, uh, and I think those ideas, um, I, I think uh, there there is definitely an interest, and that was the recommendation: is we need to do those tools so that we have more quality improvement measure things that are going on uh, with the SRTR data, and it's not just the PSRs, you know, for private payers to use. So I think. What's the time window? Well, those are, uh, those are things, those are big ones, because now it's not just, you know, you need to have it linked into donor net or something like that where you have real-time data. And, and so those are big issues, and that those are the conversations that are going on now with HRSA and OPTN and how can we do this and how do we do this, you know, and, can, and is it feasible and things like that. So, yeah, we would like to do that, but I think the feasibility issues have to be worked out. I just had one comment or, and one question. One question was with this, uh, you were talking about with smaller institute or smaller transplant institutes uh, and the sliding P scale. If in theory you have adequate power based on the number of variables for the model, wouldn't that inflate how the smaller institutes, I mean in theory that it inflates how the smaller institutes are performing relative to the larger institutes, number one. Um, and then my comment too was I think that and Dr. Denny kind of started to touch on this I, I think is ha taking into account like you said the population so when you look at the behavioral health research and I was wondering if, it, if they have looked at the behavioral health research and you talk about risk and risk perception people the, a the vast majority of the average person is, is really very poor at interpreting even basic numbers um, and so that's a part of the reason the star system things like the star systems have come out so I was just wondering, you know, when you say dissemination of information and you're talking about numerics, anytime you talk about numerics, patients can misinterpret that data. So I was just wondering, um, has that been looked at from the behavioral health research perspective? Yeah, no, I, I think good questions. Uh, so first question, the small centers, we don't have enough power in the current models. And that's why they use this different sort of, you know, you have to have one failure and a two and a half year cord. And then, so because of the current models, they just don't have power. Uh, so anything to help that. I think we're open to that suggestion. Um, 
and, and the second point is sort of using sort of understanding behavior. And you're right. I mean, the, the current, if you look at the current PSRs, is a bunch of tables and a bunch of numbers. And we're supposed to give this out to our patients. And I, I don't know how much of that actually gets through in terms of information. Um, so, you know, there is a lot of work that needs to get done to actually make it patient friendly. And um, no, none of those uh, things have been done yet. Yeah, this is just a start. And that's why I think, you know, everybody agrees that there's a lot of room for improvement. Dr. Shrani for a very intriguing presentation and also provocative questions. And hopefully we see the SRTR heading into the co continuous quality improvement world to improve transparent outcomes. Thank you so much. Thank you.